it's going to be moving forward. Yep, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to start with a case um, to sort of, I guess, describe the type of person that I would normally see um, and where the struggle really is with counseling these patients. So Jason's a 23-year-old affirmed male assigned female at birth and presents to your clinic with his fiance, Kate, who's a cisgender woman. Um, and Jason's getting ready to start testosterone. Um, and so they want to talk about fertility preservation. Um, they're getting ready to get married. They're not really looking to have kids right now, seven to eight years from now, um, using Jason's eggs, donor sperm, and Kate carrying the pregnancy. And they tell you that they want a big family. And so you walk them through the process, including the costs, and both their faces turn white. And they say, well, we're going to have to use all the money we just saved up for our wedding. And they want to know, do we have to do that? Do we have to cancel our dream wedding and spend money on fertility preservation? Or is it going to be okay to come back seven or eight years from now and build our family then? So why does this matter? Why is this worth being one of the four talks today um, at the practice committee? Um, and so we're seeing an increasing prevalence of um, transgender patients. So there's two U.S. studies that came out around the same time using the same uh, survey that estimated prevalence in the U.S. at 0.5 to 0.6 percent, which equates to about 1.4 million U.S. adults. Um, and that was a doubling um, from the same study three years prior. Even more importantly, in my opinion, is that in the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is a survey of high school students, 1.8% of US teens identify as transgender non-binary. So that'll be a tripling of the patients of reproductive age that we're gonna be seeing who may wanna build their families. There's also increasing visibility. So is it really that the prevalence is increasing versus people are feeling more comfortable um, expressing their gender identity? And that visibility is obviously positive and negative. Um, transgender celebrities, an increased research focus, but also the bathroom bills, the military ban, and the CDC banned words. Um, and we are not treating these patients right. Um, this is out of um, the 2015 transgender survey. And um, you know, at the top, maybe not surprising, a quarter of the respondents said they had to teach their healthcare provider about transgender people in order to get appropriate care. But then when you go down to the bottom, things that should be 0%, um, a healthcare provider was physically rough or abusive when treating them. They were physically attacked by someone during their visit in a healthcare setting. They were sexually assaulted in a healthcare setting. And so it's not surprising why these patients are not um, necessarily presenting to us uh, when they first start their transition and why they don't trust us. And so my talk is a little bit about med the medicine, but also a little bit about how to make your clinic more welcoming and comfortable um, for these patients. Um, just to drive home my point for one more slide, um, same survey when they asked patients, um, uh, did you seek med necessary medical care? And I'm not talking about fertility now, I'm talking about asthma, diabetes, heart attacks. 23% did not seek it because they were uh, afraid that they'd be mistreated. Um, about a third didn't seek it because they couldn't afford it. 15% um, reported themselves as uninsured versus 12.8% of the general population. And about 55% had to travel greater than 10 miles for transition related care. Just a brief overview of gender affirming treatment. Um, in my practice, uh, the REIs provide the gender affirming hormones as well as the fertility. <laughs> um, but just a brief overview to talk um, about what, what we're talking about when we're counseling these patients. So in our transmasculine patients, testosterone is usually all that's needed. It can be given intramuscular, subcutaneously, or transdermal. Um, and we're just, I always tell my patients, like, I'm not trying to make you Superman. Um, I just, you know, want your blood levels in the same level um, as any other man. And then with transgender women, it's a little more complicated, particularly when you're thinking about fertility, um, because they get both estradiol, but also an anti-androgen. Um, and again, we're looking for female range serum levels. As far as peripubertal children go, there's no role for hormone therapy prior to puberty, right? Kids are pretty undifferentiated. Um, but we do know that adolescents, particularly who are dysphoric around the time of puberty, are likely to persist. Um, and unfortunately, to this day, there is still no agreed upon age for starting hormone therapy. For kids who uh, present, and I do not do this, to be clear, this is our pediatric colleagues, but um, for kids who present at Tanner stage two to three, we can start junior age agonists and basically halt puberty while the family and the child um, figure out what they want to do and tell physicians, uh, family, and patient feel comfortable moving forward with gender affirming hormones. And for transmasculine youth who present after puberty, um, often if they're not ready to start testosterone, we can give them progestins for menstrual suppression as that is often the most distressing part. 
And then again, because this is a fertility talk, um, I just wanted to bring up how many of these patients have either had a sterilizing surgery or want to have it someday. It's more than half in both transgender men and transgender women. Um, and not all of these patients are being counseled about the effect of this surgery. And while it seems obvious, I'm sure to everyone in this room, if you remove a uterus, um, you will no longer be able to carry a pregnancy. It is not always obvious to our patients. So what do we know? Not much. Um, so the effect of long-term gender affirming hormone therapy is largely unknown. And so there are a ton of human studies. They're mostly observational. They're mostly case studies and case series. Um, and they mostly assess short-term therapy. So a lot of them are at the time of surgery, uh, gender affirming surgery after one year on testosterone. And I don't think that really answers the question for us of what to tell the person in their late teens or their early twenties, what's gonna happen if they wanna build their family in their thirties. We know almost nothing about individuals who had puberty halted with the junior age agonist and then went directly into uh, testosterone or estradiol therapy. And then as I already mentioned, many gender affirming surgeries are sterilizing. And so ASRM and Endocrine Society basically came out um, and because of these unknowns said, you know, we really need to be talking about fertility preservation prior to starting any gender affirming therapy. And I, I um, love that ASRM of, of the three societies that came out and said this was the only one who says that we really need to be telling these patients that we don't have the data. Um, you know, so we're almost, we're almost recommending this out of a fear of consequences um, of gender affirming hormone therapy that we don't have definitive data on. Um, WPATH, which is the uh, main uh, Association for Transgender Health Providers um, also uh, came out with similar guidelines. And so what do we know? Um, we know that when surveyed, about half of transgender people express a desire to have children. This survey did not ask about uh, genetically related versus children in general, but at least half wanna build a family. Um, about 40% of transgender men surveyed said they would have considered gamete cryopreservation if it had been available to them at the time um, that they started testosterone. We know that transgender men with children score better on mental health scales, that transgender women with children have a lower suicide risk, and um, hopefully I don't need this bullet much longer, but um, there's absolutely no evidence that having a transgender parent results in adverse outcomes in long-term psychosocial functioning of the children. As far as transgender youth, similar to our cisgender youth who are coming in with a cancer diagnosis, a lot of them don't know what they want in the future, um, which makes counseling even harder. Um, and I know we have you know, lots of good groups uh, through the PIN uh, looking at fertility preservation in general and youth. Um, but I was actually surprised with these stats that um, a quarter to a third actually knew they wanted genetic uh, parenthood in the future. And so you can imagine that that number will likely increase with time. Um, th uh, there was a qualitative study, uh, the Chen and Simons um, report that did show that the process is emotionally and physically demanding for transgender adolescents who undergo fertility preservation. And these are even in adolescents who says like, you know, everything went fine. I really wanted this. I would do it again. I had time to prepare, but it was still challenging as you can imagine, because a lot of our fertility preservation procedures are counter to their gender identity. And so this is how I always look at it when I'm counseling patients about fertility preservation. Um, obviously, I don't go through all of this with the 14-year-old trans youth, but um, my adult uh, patients, you know, I talk about who do you partner with? What organs and gametes do they have? What organs and gametes do you have? What are you guys willing to use? Like, just because you have a uterus doesn't mean you're willing to use it. Just because your partner has um, sperm and you have ovaries doesn't, maybe you're not willing to have penetrative sex. Um, and so I think it requires this conversation. And I really try to ungender um, uh, my words to just talk about gametes and organs and who's willing to use what. And then that's how um, we figure out what the best option is moving forward. Um, so I am a reproductive endocrinologist who sees mostly um, people with ovaries. Um, so that's going to be the focus, but a little bit on trans feminine individuals. There is some histologic data that estradiol exposure um, does affect the histology of the testes um, with abnormal appearance of both Sertoli and Leydig cells, fatty degeneration, um, and impaired spermatogenesis. And in interestingly, regardless of antiandrogen use, so it's really the estradiol having an effect, although the stage of maturation arrest and the incidence of azospermia differs greatly um, among studies. Um, these are a couple other studies looking at semen analyses, um, both on estradiol and after discontinuation. Um, again, really variable results, um, but in a lot of patients, some sperm was still present. And so again, that's why I think it's so important to have this conversation in the beginning of, you know, what organs does the person you're partnered with have? Um, because if let's say um, this person has, um, 
ovaries and their partner has sperm and they want to use a gestational carrier, they're going to need IVF anyway. So maybe those few sperm that are still present um, are fine. Maybe they don't have to come off their estradiol. Um, they did see uh, an improvement. Um, and so for people who maybe need to do inseminations or want to have intercourse to reproduce, now that's someone who might need to come off their estrogen. And then really interestingly, I have two studies cited here, but there's actually three that I'm aware of now, show an increased incidence of abnormal semen parameters um, in trans feminine individuals who have never taken estradiol. And the pathophysiology of that is really not understood. I think this is fascinating because they've controlled for um, uh, behaviors like tucking or antidepressant use or substance use, like all the things that you think might affect a semen analysis, they controlled for, and this difference um, still persists. All right, so how about transmasculine people? We certainly know it's possible to get pregnant after testosterone exposure. And these were um, two widely publicized pregnancies in transgender men um, who purposefully conceived uh, after being on testosterone for years. Um, this is a study on pregnancy in transgender men by Light et al. Um, but it, it um, selected for people who'd had a live birth. So 84% um, of the subjects who'd been on tea prior to their pregnancy did use their own eggs. So again, proof of concept, we certainly know pregnancy is possible after tea. 32% uh, conceived on tea, so um, uh, also proof of concept that tea is not a good contraceptive. Um, and there was no difference in perinatal complications. That said, because they controlled for live birth, we don't know how many tried to get pregnant and didn't, or miscarried or had a late loss or terminated for some reason. And so again, most of the data we have is proof of concept um, that you can uh, get pregnant after T um, and carry a pregnancy after T, but not necessarily the efficiency. This was another um, uh, manuscript from the same group. Um, and they were looking at both contraceptive use and family planning. Um, and out of 197 transgender men in their study, uh, 32 uh, respondents had had 60 pregnancies. Um, and they found that those who had never taken T were nearly three times more likely to have been pregnant than those who had taken tea. And so um, some people have used uh, this data to say testosterone uh, adversely affects um, your ability to get pregnant. I'm not so sure that's true. I'm not so sure this is the right study design um, to look at that because maybe people who knew they wanted to get pregnant waited to start tea until after they built their families. You know, we don't really know when we're looking backward uh, why that correlation um, exists. And then sadly, 51% reported that their healthcare providers had not asked about their fertility desires prior to starting their gender affirming treatment. Um, when I tell people about my research, they're like, oh, just, just draw AMH. And why don't you just look at these studies on AMH? And I did look at these two studies on AMH. Um, and unfortunately in one of them, um, participants in addition to testosterone were on a GNH agonist and an aromatase inhibitor. And in the other one, they were on a progestin. One study showed significant suppression of AMH um, on testosterone. The other one showed no change and maybe even a trend toward increase in AMH. Um, and so I don't, I don't think either of these studies answer our question. There are a dozen um, studies on uh, the effect of testosterone histology uh, from studies performed at the time of gender affirming oophorectomy. Some of the studies show PCO morphology, which is a little complicated because we know that there's a higher incidence of PCOS in the transmasculine population. So is that why they saw a slightly higher incidence? Um, there are other studies that showed no difference, but again, these are all small case series and they all have short testosterone exposure. Of the studies I um, list here, the mean time on testosterone was between 12 and 37 months. There's several case series of fertility preservation. Um, I thought one, the top one, Maxwell, gives us some inf information. Um, uh, it's only three <laughs> transgender men who underwent uh, egg freezing prior to starting tea, but I thought it was interesting that two out of three have already returned, um, which is a higher number than we often see in our, um, in our oncofertility patients. Um, and then Chen et al. Uh, looked at transmasculine youth um, and uh, they noted higher than expected gonadotropin requirements. Although honestly, I see that in my cisgender youth as well often. Um, and these are all prior to starting T. Um, these two case reports came out in the last few years. Um, and I think this is a huge question in our field. Um, the one on the left, Rothenberg, was actually here out of Pittsburgh, uh, and I think discouraged a lot of us. So it was a 16-year-old um, who'd been on a junior diagnosis for two years. It was maintained throughout stimulation, uh, required gonadotropin injections for 30 days, similar to like a hypo-hypo patient, and they only were able to freeze four mature eggs. And so I think a lot of us looked at that, and I mean, even though we all know in our brains you're not supposed to take a ton out of a case report, it was the only thing we had, and we all went, crap, like 
is this going to be a problem for future fertility? And then Martin et al. out of Wash U published um, 15 year old transmasculine adolescent had been on junior agonist for three years. Um, the junior agonist implant was removed prior to stimulation, impossible to know whether or not that made a difference. Um, this uh, child only required 12 days of stimulation. They gave letrozole um, at the same time to minimize elevations in estradiol, and they were able to. Um, uh, cryopreserved 22 mature eggs. So um, while I know case studies and case series are not um, the highest level of evidence, I think we need to keep publishing these um, because we're all only seeing one or two a year. Um, and uh, I also think we need to start pooling our data. Um, this is the first study that I'm aware of looking at ART outcomes of um, transgender men who'd been on testosterone. And so when they compared cisgender women to all transgender men, regardless of testosterone history, um, they did not find a difference. But then when they split the transgender men out to um, history of testosterone versus not, they did show significantly more eggs were retrieved and significant or and a trend toward um, increased maturity in um, the transgender men who had never been exposed to testosterone. Small study, their N of transgender individuals was 13, and the quality is not known. This is egg freezing. This isn't fertilization. This isn't um, PGT. This isn't live birth. There was a second study that came out, um, again, looking cisgender women versus all transgender men, and they actually found um, increased eggs uh, retrieved in the transgender men. So pretty much the exact opposite of the study I just showed you. Um, they did show a higher gonadotropin dose requirement. Um, and then when they just looked at cisgender women versus transgender men uh, with a testosterone history, they showed no difference. Um, they weren't necessarily powered to show a difference, um, but either way, it's again, the complete opposite of um, the last study I just showed. Um, again, required more gonadotropins and again, a small study. Um, so my never ending plug toward pooling our data so that we can answer these questions um, more accurately for our patients. Um, there's a qualitative study on how transmasculine individuals perceive uh, fertility preservation. It was 15 trans men, um, seven of whom had been on testosterone prior. And not surprisingly, the majority of those found resumption of menses and the increased estradiol levels to be very distressing. Unfortunately, they didn't um, assess regret. They didn't ask like, okay, it was distressing, but are you glad you did it or would you do it again, which I wish they had. Um, and they don't report medical outcomes. And so when I'm thinking of this, like, how do we make this less distressing? So now we have these survey studies in both youth um, and in transmasculine adults saying like, yeah, I wanted to do this, but it was really distressing. Um, and so I think that one of the biggest questions uh, facing this area right now is what to do about testosterone around the time of ovarian stimulation. Um, in many patients, cessation of testosterone is likely to increase dysphoria, particularly for patients who've been on testosterone for over a decade and are a man in every part of their lives. Um, suddenly getting a period after 10 years without periods, as you might imagine, can be distressing. And so some think that testosterone needs to be stopped for three months to um, have an complete cycle of folliculogenesis without any testosterone exposure. And in the early papers, that's what I saw the most of. There's others that stop T just before. So those two studies that I showed you of ART outcomes, those both stop testosterone just before. Uh, and I think the range of time off testosterone is anywhere from like one to four months. I would argue that you can maintain testosterone during stimulation. And I don't have time to make my complete argument, but um, we give testosterone to some people, right? To poor responders to help increase um, their yield. We have women with PCOS and CAH um, who have uh, often elevated androgens. And I'm not saying that a cycle on testosterone is gonna be an identical to a cycle without it. We actually have just gotten some mouse data um, in our lab that shows that maybe, thank you, um, outcomes are slightly worse, but I think you need to have a conversation with the patient of, do you want um, the absolute best fertility preservation outcome? And, and if you do, great. And like, let's stop your testosterone. And that's probably the most surefire right, way. But I also say, will being on testosterone uh, during your stim affect your outcome? It might, it might not. We don't have enough data. I mean, I have some data in a mouse. Um, we, don't, we don't have data in humans um, to tell us one way or another, but let's talk about how bad your dysphoria is. Were you suicidal before you started, started testosterone? Then we probably shouldn't stop your testosterone if that means that we sacrifice a few eggs. Um, but if you want one or two children and you're 23 with great ovarian reserve, I'm not gonna stop your tea. Um, and so that's, I guess that's our position at Michigan, um, we do give aromatase inhibitors, just like in our breast cancer and endometrial cancer patients, um, to keep estradiol levels low. Um, if they have a progestin IUD, we leave it in place. Um, 
especially for our patients who've been on testosterone for a long time, if they're not having penetrative sex, they have a lot of vaginal atrophy. Um, and so we often use transabdominal and pediatric probes, and then just a reminder for FDA lab testing if they're planning on a gestational carrier. Ovarian tissue acquired preservation seems like a great option um, because it could be performed at the time of gender affirming ophorectomy, but we have to be comfortable with the fact that we don't have a ton of data on OTC, and we definitely don't have a ton of data on the effect of testosterone on the ovaries and how OTC works with uh, testosterone exposed ovaries. And so my last few minutes, I just want to talk quickly about creating an inclusive space. And I have a um, non-binary colleague who's really opened my eyes to the fact that it is not enough to say, I am an LGBTQ friendly provider, you know, that's fine. But if a patient walks in your office before they see you, they see your front door, they see your waiting room, they see your clerks, they see your MAs. And so um, in their opinion, my colleague, and it's really opened my eyes to this, you need signage, you need to be screaming that you will be treated well here. And that goes back to my original slides about how poorly trans and non-binary patients have traditionally been treated in our healthcare system. We changed our EMR so that people could indicate their sex at birth, um, indicate their pronouns, indicate what name they want to be used. And so that our MAs and our clerks aren't misgendering people. Um, I think we really need to think about, we're trying to get away of having um, signage that says women's health clinic um, or that sort of thing so that we don't exclude our transmasculine patients. Um, we've started using a lot less gendered language when we're talking to our transgender patients. You know, some of them aren't comfortable with the word vagina. Um, there are certainly a lot of papers like this that um, suggest other words. I always just ask my patients, you know, how do you want me to refer to your organs? How do you want me to refer to your gametes? Um, some people aren't comfortable with sperm. Some people couldn't care less. Um, and so I found that that is the best way to go about that. We have um, indicators on our website um, that we are gender inclusive and friendly. Um, and then we make every single person at the University of Michigan be trained in um, uh, gender competent care. And so that's from the janitor to the security guard, to the clerk, to the MA, to the physician. Um, we all have to go through this and learning. Um, and then if any of you are really interested in increasing your transgender um, healthcare knowledge, this was out of uh, Michigan, worked with ACOG and CREOG to create this healthcare curriculum and basically goes over all of these um, topics in transgender care. It's free. Um, this is not reproduction. This is just gender affirming care. Um, there are a ton of websites that have great information. Um, if anyone is interested in doing gender affirming hormone therapy, I would posit that most reproductive endocrinologists are more than qualified um, to provide gender affirming uh, care. I think the endocrine society probably has the best guideline on how to do that. And my last thought is assume not. Um, so anytime a patient comes into your office, no matter what they look like, no matter what their partner looks like, you have no idea what gametes organs they have and who's willing to use what. Um, and so we have uh, just started asking. That's all we have. Thank you. Did I make it? <laughs>